So, um, let's talk about refactoring. Um, so, my name's Kevin Henney, and um, I've been around a while. I remember when the first computers were created. No, sorry, that's not that old. That's actually um, uh, Brexit technology. It's one of Britain's uh, great exports. Um, you know, we don't need everybody else's silicon. Uh, we can do our own. Um, now, normally, we associate refactoring with um, dealing with legacy. This is one of my favorite legacy systems. Uh, we're not entirely sure what it does. We don't know who built it. We don't know why. But it seems to work twice a year. And you're not allowed to touch it. Um, I took this photograph almost exactly five years ago. Yeah, yeah, Valentine's Day, because I'm an incurable romantic. Um, took my wife down to see that. There's even a crow perched on one of the trilithons. And that kind of is the harbinger of, of death and foreboding. And that's the, the experience many people have when they look at code. Most people work on yesterday's code. All this talk about technology being tomorrow is nonsense. Um, most people spend their life living in the past. If you are spending eight hours on a code base, approximately seven hours, as a typical maximum, was spent in the past, dealing with the issues of the past. If you're really lucky, one hour is spent on the future. On the other hand, that might just be uh, complaining about the code base to a colleague uh, by the coffee machine. But in many people's minds, they associate refactoring as a kind of response to legacy. In other people's minds, they associate refactoring as just a shortcut key. Okay, it's the, hence the clickbait title. A lot of people go, oh yeah, refactoring, it's on my context menu. Yeah, I know the shortcut for rename. And that's kind of it. But we need to go a little bit further than this. I mean, where does a lot of this stuff come from? Where does a lot of our response, and actually I'm going to say some of our response is not entirely accurate, and our perception is not entirely accurate, where does it come from? So, wonderful quote from Neil Ford. Developers are drawn to complexity like moths to a flame, often with the same outcome. Um, there is this sense that sometimes we create our own complexity. Um, the human mind is a wonderful thing. Um, we're very good at speculating. It's a form of imagination. We imagine how a system might be. The problem is not that we use our imagination. It's not that we are able to speculate. It's that we then go and put it in the code. I wonder if, oh yeah, somebody might do this quick, accommodate that with an extra kind of hook or an extra workaround or an attribute or something that'll make it easier to develop in future. Guess what? The future arrives and you're in that seven hours going, what, the actual? This is stupid. The future's arrived. It looks like nothing like this, but I still have to bear the weight of all those decisions in the past that were supposed to make the future easier. We are very good at taking simple things and making them complex. We're also very good at taking things that are sophisticated and making them simplistic, causing exactly the same problem. Yeah. And a lot of people then attribute this to technical debt. They describe it as technical debt. Now, it's not that it isn't a technical debt, but th there are two issues here. First of all, technical debt is not necessarily a bad thing. When sometimes when people tell me, they say, oh, our, our code base has lots of technical debt, right? But what are you trying to say? Are you trying to say it's a good thing or a bad thing? Now, whenever I do stuff like that, people, they, well, they actually, what I hope they think is, wow, Kevin's challenging my perception. What they actually think is, Kevin's an idiot. Doesn't he know about technical debt? Well, no, I do know about technical debt. Um, we are now at a point where it's over 30 years old as an idea. Ward Cunningham developed it in 92. Specifically, though, he didn't call it technical debt. He called it debt. The term technical debt was not truly cemented in place till the early 2000s. At the end of the 1990s, I was using the term occasionally technical debt, but I didn't like it. I preferred quality debt or design debt. Design debt was my favorite. But as of the early 2000s, we cemented it in to mean we, we used the term technical debt. But the reason I challenge this is that Ward did not originally say debt is a bad thing. He just said debt is a thing, and you can, it can be bad, but you can also use debt constructively. In fact, the reason he introduced it as a metaphor was to use it constructively. 
We've ended up using it only destructively. We use debt for a number of things. I can run up a debt short term in order to achieve a benefit that I might not otherwise have been able to achieve. I can even do this long term and have a structured repayment. So my wife and I had a mortgage. That's a classic example of a debt. It's a very long term thing. What's the benefit? You get a house. But I don't wait for people with um, baseball bats to come around to collect the money. We have a structured repayment model. Debt is not intrinsically bad, debt is a thing. The question is what you do next as to whether or not it's good or bad. So when people tell me we have lots of technical debt, they're not actually telling me what they want to tell me. So technical debt is an observation you can make on a system of people and technology. And you can make a value judgment about it. But what most people are ignoring is how did you get it? It's, technical debt's not a process, it's an outcome. There is a process, which I started to call technical neglect. Because people keep being distracted. Oh, we've got technical debt. What do we do about it? Do you have unmanaged technical debt? Yes, that's what we said. Well, you should say it. It's unmanaged technical debt. That's your problem. How did you get it? We have no idea. It just appeared. Like the bugs. But until you understand that, you need to understand that it is the act of a thousand edits. It doesn't happen just once. Technical debt does just not mysteriously appear overnight. Oh, look, I suddenly got a mortgage. I hadn't planned on that. Yeah, banks are a little more cautious about things like that. It's more a case of these are small debts. They're your little credit card things. I'll just charge that. I'll just charge this. I'll just do that. Oh, a snack here, a snack there, a shortcut here, a shortcut there. Yeah, I know there's a better way of doing this. And a thousand edits later, you're going like, ooh, where did this come from? And unfortunately, it's got interest. It's got your interest. It's got percentage-wise interest. But you need to look at the process. Neglect. We have physical neglect. We have emotional neglect. These are concepts that are known in the world. We should also look at the idea of technical neglect. And then in response to this, we often position refactoring. So if you've not come across commit strip, you need to come across commit strip. There you go. That was easy. Um, got a project manager talking to a developer here. So will the refactoring, will refactoring the code improve the loading time? Not really. Will it improve security then? Nope. So it's for browser compatibility. Oh, absolutely not. So tell me, why is it always the same old story with you guys wanting to refactor everything? I need to know. Because as devs, if we know we've left messy code, we can't stop thinking about it. When we wake up in the morning, at lunchtime, in the evening, when we go home, and when we're trying to go to sleep, and for those of you who were awake at 3 o'clock in the morning every now and then, then as well. It haunts us, you know. It haunts us. It's just that I could make it a little bit better. Now, at this point, we need to recognize that software development is a knowledge-based endeavor. What you're doing with a code base is you are codifying, quite literally codifying knowledge. Your knowledge of the domain, knowledge of the technologies, knowledge of how you work with the tools. It's literally codified. So in other words, it's a collaborative effort saying, here's our best shot. Now, when you put it like that, it's just like, well, here's a shot. The problem is, here is our knowledge. Here is the point at which it was codified. It's always behind. We're always living in the past. Now, we'd like that tail to be a little bit shorter. We'd like our current thinking as reflected in our system to be as close as possible to our current thinking on our wetware. We want to reduce the distance. There's nothing more frustrating for many people. They experience this. It's not whether or not a code base is pleasant to work in. It's whether or not you know how it could be versus how it is. It's the difference. Okay? And it has often been said that comparison is the thief of joy, and you should never compare yourself to others. But when you're dealing with abstract entities, I know that this code could be better, and not just a bit tidier. Sometimes you might be looking at a system. I've had this experience often enough visiting companies where you're looking at it and you're going like, well, this code base could be about 5 to 10% of its current size. 5 to 10% of the current size of a code base is a, a huge step change in quality of life and quality of delivery. It's not a slight improvement. It is a fundamentally different kind of development, and yet we often deny ourselves this. So this gives us a kind of sense. We need to have a better understanding of architecture. Now, software architecture is a metaphor, as indeed is technical debt. Um, 
Every now and then I hear people trying to debate why it's not a good metaphor. Um, that's a really dumb debate. It's a great metaphor. It's a metaphor. That's the whole point. All metaphors are not supposed to be identities. If you're worried about your brick alignment in your code, you've misunderstood the point of metaphors. The whole point of a metaphor is to shed light on something and say, I wonder if that applies here. It's to provoke questions. It's to provoke thinking. If you're going to shut it down with an argument that it's not exactly the same thing, then you have denied yourself the opportunity to think. And sometimes when you look at a certain code base, that's what you want. I don't want to have to think about this. But this idea is important because we often reduce architecture to the technologies, the big box diagrams, and yet we forget the most important thing about the metaphor. Architecture is for people to live in. I don't see many software architecture texts point this out because it's exactly the same. It's for developers to live in. What is that experience like? Now, if we're going to talk about sculpture, there is a quote that is, um, I've, I've actually put the full attribution here because it's one of those ones that does the internet, uh, does the rounds on the internet. There is a beautiful angel in that block of marble and I'm going to find it. All I have to do is knock off the outside pieces of marble and be very careful not to chisel into the angel with my chisel. I've seen this attributed to Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci. Honestly, I, I swear, if you look in the right corners of the internet, you'll find it attributed to Abraham Lincoln as well. Um, Actually, it was George Pentecost, uh, the angel in the marble, uh, early 20th century. But there's a thing here. This is a great quote. It's quite inspiring, makes you think about things. But we're missing something again. We work with software. The first four letters are soft. We actually get to chisel into the angel and then back out again. In fact, we should use a, a cuddlier font. There you go. Soft. What we often struggle with is the loss of softness. We often treat software as if it is indeed hard and unforgiving. Whereas actually, one of the coolest things is, ah, I changed my mind. There we go. Done. That's it. You have the ability to do time travel, which honestly is way cooler than most other professions. You know, from the, the very humble control Z, I'm just going to undo the last action. Yeah. Oh, I've spilled my coffee. Control Z on reality does not work. I'm, perhaps it works in the metaverse, but nobody's been there. We don't know. So here's the thing. We get to undo things. We actually get to go and say, no, nah, let's roll back to the last good commit. We get to time travel. We get to move things around. We get to speculate and try things out. We even get to try parallel universes. Yeah? Forget the multiverse that's currently popular in SF movies. We've been doing that for decades. Software developers got there first. Time travel and parallel universes. Next time you're introducing yourself to somebody, please keep this in mind. Don't just say software developer. You're denying yourself a way cooler job description. But this softness is something that we lose. So I'm going to take you back to the late 90s. Refactoring by Martin Fowler. Now, this was a book whose time had very much come. I really first heard the term refactoring in the context of extreme programming. Extreme programming, uh, the original XP, um, kind of came around in the mid-90s, mid um, pioneered by Kent Beck and others. And refactoring was described as a principal practice. And I remember looking at that going like, yes, this is... This is what I've been trying to express and how I've been thinking about coding for a while. In fact, the first company I worked at after university, I didn't have a word for it. And I was dealing with a legacy code base. And I just reached for the nearest mathematical idea, which is factor factoring or factorization. In fact, I'm blessed by the fact that we have not ended up with refactorization as a term, although I'm sure that there are corners of the internet that would prefer that because it sounds more technical. But that's the key thing is this idea has been around for a long time, but it's not been articulated as a first-class practice. So that started making it real. Martin Fowler was one of the people on the original um, C3 XP project with Kent Beck, and he ended up writing this book, Refactoring. I went to, uh, let's see, it was January 1999, and I went to the OOP conference in Munich, and I went to a one-day workshop with Martin there. 
And it was just like, yes, this is exactly what I've been waiting for. It was kind of a breakdown of like just really simple, structured in terms of kind of pattern-like thinking. But one of the things that has been most overlooked is the subtitle. Improving the design of existing code. He's not just saying tidy up your code, make it a bit cleaner. He's talking about something much more fundamental. He's talking about improving the design. It's a, and it's, it's actually kind of grasping that and saying this is possible. What is also interesting here is that this book was written before we had widespread refactoring tools. Although refactoring browsers had existed up until that point, um, they had certainly not gone mainstream by any stretch of the imagination. And it wasn't really until the early 2000s that we hit that point. And Martin gives a definition here. What do we mean by a refactoring? A change made to the internal structure of software to make it easy to understand and cheaper to modify without changing its observable behavior. We'll come back to what we mean by observable behavior in a moment. There's a, there's a subtlety in there that is often glossed over. But notice, to make it easy to understand and cheaper to modify. Now, what he's not saying here is take code that sucks and turn it into code that is good. That is certainly part of this. But sometimes we also take code that was good, but the world has moved on. There's nothing right, you know, we, we sometimes, it's very easy to look on the decisions of the past and say, ah, you know, that's terrible. But remember, you know a lot more than you did in the past. That person may have been you that wrote the code. You're in a, you have a privileged position. Uh, and in the absence of actually real-time travel, um, you're not able to take advantage of that and send a, a letter uh, or a missive or, you know, do peripheral-style kind of communication back to your former self or your former colleague and go, hey, just try this. That switch statement, it's not going to scale. That switch statement with five cases is going to become a switch case, uh, a statement with 25 cases, and it's going to be replicated in large parts of your code, which if you're being paid by the line of code is magnificent. If you're not, not so good. In other words, consider something else. Maybe polymorphism. Maybe it's just a, a table of callbacks. You know, use lambdas. The point there is that these are all possibilities. At the time you put in four or five cases, that's entirely reasonable. Okay? You, you don't necessarily know that the world will move in a particular way. You give it your best shot. And then you come back, and many of the things that we consider to be not good code, it's not that they were not originally good code, but they have grown to be that because of either their own growth but, or the change in the situation around the code. The world moves on. Yeah, I, you know, code base I dealt with years ago um, struggled with the fact that it needed to move into a multi-threaded world. And it was single-threaded. Now, it wasn't written badly single-threaded, but it was, its assumptions were everywhere. It was very single-threaded. You know, the smallest assumption was, oh, yeah, the world is as we left it. The smallest assumption is that when I do that and walk away, that that clicker does not move of its own spontaneous will. Okay? There is no race condition between me and somebody else. I've carefully timed it so that nobody in the front row could actually valid invalidate that. Actually, it messed that up. The world just changed. That's, that's fine. So sometimes what we call bad code is historically good code. Okay? So we have this. Now, what's interesting is, without changing, exactly the same definition appears in the second edition of refactoring, which came out 20 years later. Now, the first edition, I don't necessarily recommend getting it. It's, it's good for historical reasons. Uh, it uses Java, but it's really old Java. Uh, it's pre-Java 5 for a start. Um, and it uses JUnit, but it's really old JUnit. We're on JUnit 5 now. Uh, it's JUnit 3. Um, the new book uses types. Uh, no, actually, it doesn't use TypeScript. It'd be nice if it would use TypeScript. It uses uh, JavaScript. Um, but this lives in a world where we now have automated refactoring tools. So what's its value? Well, it's still teaching about design. It's still telling you that if you don't have those refactoring tools, understand the steps that you would take and why. Most, most of design is why. Why is it like this? Why am I doing this? It's the contemplation of alternatives. And you'll find that in any set of refactorings, there's contemplation of alternatives. Sometimes you may have extract method, but you also have inline method, the exact opposite. Which one is the right one? I can't tell you. It's context dependent. The idea is that you're invited to think and figure out what's, what's my code want of me at this point? What do I know? What knowledge can I bring to bear? It's a design process. Okay, It's this process. Just as I said before, it's just like we, we, we like to look at an outcome 
an anchor on that. In this case, I talked about technical debt. And we like to think, imagine that there's some kind of you know, pinnacle of clean, good code. But actually, it's all about process. It's all about what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, when it comes to refactoring, we need to understand that there is a flow. There is a process. You, you're always making decisions. And some of these may be supported by automation. That's your automated refactorings. But a lot of them won't be, and that's fine. So let's dig further back in time. This is the early 90s, but actually it all started in the late 80s. This is um, refactoring object-oriented frameworks. This is the PhD thesis of Bill Opdyke, who was actually one of the contributors to the original refactoring book. You can see the date on that is 1992. And Ralph Johnson is, is the PhD advisor. Ralph Johnson is one of the gang of four. The following year, Ralph Johnson um, and Gamma and Helm and Vlasides would publish uh, design patterns. But Ralph Johnson's longer term work was actually refactoring. That was where most of the early re automated refactoring work was done, was at the University of Urbana-Champaign. And a lot of it was done in small talk, except this one, the original refactoring work from the late 80s to the early 90s was actually C++. Probably the language, mainstream language that's received the least love from refactoring tools. Um, and Bill Opdyke made the observation. He said the refactorings are defined to be behavior preserving, which kind of makes us think, okay, let's go back to this question of behavior preserving. What do we mean by that? Um, if you've not had breakfast yet, apologies for this, because you probably think, wow, yeah, that would look, that's, that would look really nice in my stomach. Um, however, that's, that's not the point here. The point is, of course, I'm going to talk about stacks, uh, the, probably the most overly consumed and over-specified uh, data structure um, in the history of software development. Um, but, okay, so, um, I will, so let's use some TypeScript here. I can characterize it in terms of its depth, the top element. Um, I can pop an element from it. I'm going to keep life simple. I'm going to make it a strict pop. We're not getting a side effect uh, return out of this one. I'm just going to keep life simple. And I can push a new value onto the top. Now, I've got a different, number of different ways of implementing it. I'm going to use an approach where I bind a lambda to um, a variable effect and making it a function, a constructor function. And I use um, a local variable to be private. Um, that's the thing about JavaScript and TypeScript is that there are many different object models, and some of them are more or less object-oriented than others. This one is actually the most perfect object model because it actually has a true um, separation between public and private. Um, you can't get your hands on the internal variables. And then I return effectively a tuple, um, an object that describes the ways in which I may manipulate and operate. This is the, the kind of true interface, and it satisfies the interface we specified before. And here is a simple way of implementing it. Um, I can do it all just as one-liner forwarding operations. Okay? Each one of these just uses the underlying array, and it wraps it. And then, conveniently enough, the underlying array has a couple of extra operations, like pop and push, that I can use directly. But I can strain it. I, give it, I, I now have better names. What is returned is not a thing that you can manipulate as an array, and nor should it be. It is a stack. Okay? I use an array for implementation. There is a strict separation there. And now I'm going to refactor it. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to effectively upend it, reverse it. Um, I'm going to change the implementation. I'm going to make, instead of the last element be the top, I'm going to make the zeroth element be the top. And I'm going to use different primitive operations on the array to affect that shift and unshift. Okay. Now, the point is, from the outside, this looks identical. It behaves exactly the same way. That is a refactoring. That's what we mean by behavior preserving. The idea is that I have not actually changed the usage. If I had tests, then all of those tests would pass. If I didn't have tests, then I'd send myself on one of my own test-driven development courses, because um, I should have tests for this. Uh, so the point here is that that will satisfy that. But let's understand this idea. So a right-hand rule thing I came up with a number of years ago, I find a very simple way of trying to understand what are the qualities and properties of a piece of code that are a little richer than we might normally appreciate. So functional characteristics operational characteristics, developmental characteristics. Um, we could actually go, there are lots of other um, subdivisions of this, um, but the key thing is that we've got three rather than two. The way that people normally describe such things is functional and non-functional, okay, which is a, 
I don't know. I don't know how to kind of approach the whole non-functional thing um, because um, non-functional is possibly just the least imaginative way of describing the things that aren't functional. So I've got these functional properties, and then I've got these other properties. Oh, what are they? Well, they're not the functional ones. Yeah, I've got two kids. They're both boys. The first one's called Stefan. The other one is not called not Stefan. He's got his own name. He's Yannick, okay? He's his own person. You name positively. Don't name it by what it isn't, okay? Yeah, those of you who, uh, if, you, you know, if, you're visiting, if you're visiting London and you're thinking, yeah, I'm going to go see some tourist sites. I'm going to go and see, you know, Westminster Abbey, and then I'm going to go and see not Westminster Abbey. Yeah, there's kind of a lot of options there. We need to learn to be specific. And that's what we're supposed to do in software, be specific. It's even in the words, like specification, first few letters, specific. The clue is there. So don't tell me what it isn't. Tell me what it is. And also, as an aside, in English, by the default meaning of non-functional is broken. So if you're having a conversation with non-developers, just watch out for that, OK? They're going to be looking at you going, what do you mean non-functional requirements? I want it to function. What kind of idiot wants it to break? Yeah, I want it to crash. You know, I want it to be like Azure every Wednesday. Um, so um, the point there is it's not just bad naming. It's not just a lack of imagination. It's not just a failure to be specific. It's the fact that when we look closer at this category, it reveals itself to be two, or at least two. If you want more categories, go and look at uh, ISO 25010. Um, especially if you're at three, awake at 3 o'clock in the morning, it will send you to sleep. But it's a really good breakdown of eight different categories of kind of like software product qualities. Anyway, let's stick with these three. By functional, I mean semantics. It's the stuff I was talking about in terms of that stack. It's the stuff that we normally think about in terms of user stories and requirements. By operational, it's not what it does, it's how it does it. That's time and space. Okay? That's like, how, lo how long does this take? That's our performance characteristics. That's where we care about availability and things like that. That's where a lot of the illities that live at runtime, and that's the thing that unifies, that's the thing that unifies um, the uh, uh, operational and functional Things. They're both runtime qualities. They can be experienced and observed at runtime. Okay? So a user will experience those at runtime. But they won't experience the developmental qualities. Developmental qualities are really properties about the maintainability, habitability, the degree to which you have managed the technical debt, uh, the portability of the code, the qualities of the code. And if, you, if you have particular design conventions and, and guidelines for your architecture and detailed code, that's where those are followed. Those are, those are requirements that don't come from the outside, they come from the team. These are what we want from our code because we live in the architecture. This is how we like to live. So that, but this is often neglected. Sadly, that's also why I put it at the bottom because everybody kind of sees the first two and they go, yeah, whatever. It's at the bottom, it doesn't really matter. We can't see it, it's below a kind of like imaginary line down the middle of the screen. So when, what happens? Let's, let's understand this as a simple way of classifying the changes that we make to our code. And so, in other words, we probably need a better understanding of how we change our code, how we interact with our code. Often we end up with just like, I changed something. Um, many years ago, I worked with a developer who went by the suitably anonymous name of John Smith. And that was, the, that was somehow perfect because um, his commit messages were also suitably anonymous. Every commit message was pretty much the same. Uh, changed some code, fixed some bugs, added some features. Wow, thanks, John. That, that, that was really specific. I'm sure the diff will be very useful to me. Um, we can break these things down and understanding the changes that we make. If we have a simple three-axis system, no, it's not perfect, but then again, my fingers are not at perfect right angles, so it's good enough. But as a simple model of understanding, it was like, okay, what have I changed? When I add a feature, my goal is to improve or increase the functionality available. Whether that is at an individual function or a software product level, I am adding something that was not there before. What happens to the performance characteristics? Maybe they change, maybe they stay the same. If they change, maybe they get better, maybe they get worse. But that's not our goal. Our goal is improve this, more semantic um, uh, capability. Likewise, the developmental quality. Obviously, we don't want it to get worse, but that's not our goal. Our goal is to add a feature. Interestingly enough, this looks a lot like bug fixing. Um, 
when you fix a bug, when you fix a defect, you're actually, the word defect is surprisingly close to the word deficit. You are fixing a deficit. In other words, we promised you this much functionality, but you got this much. That shortfall is a bug. Here is a thing that you can't do that you should be able to do. So although it moves in the same direction, it does so from below the waterline rather than from above it. Okay? So the movement in that sense is the same, but the sense uh, or the, the meaning of it is different. But it gets more interesting when we start looking at things like optimization. Because optimization is resolutely not about changing the semantics. Optimization, because otherwise, you know, hey, I've made it 10 times faster, is not very effective when you say, yes, but it's buggy as well. Yes, but it's a fast bug rather than a slow bug. That's not a virtue. So there is an idea here that it's a behavior or a functionality preserving transformation. Now, the problem is I just slipped into it. We have a habit, and you saw it in the Bill Opdyke quote and the uh, Martin Fowler quote, of just assuming that behavior means the semantics, it means the functionality, and that somehow performance is not a behavior. Trust me, performance is absolutely a behavior. Um, it's just that we have a bias, particularly you know, with the shadow of computer science haunting software development, we have a bias towards semantics because the other stuff's really messy. But behavior is more than just the semantics. It is um, it's how it does it. If something uses more memory than it should, that's a behavioral uh, problem that you're dealing with. So we need to be a little cautious sometimes about how we use the word behavior. And we see that our goal is to improve some aspect of the operational access. Uh, in truth, sometimes something else will get worse. You know, we, 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 we trade space for time in many cases. I'm going to add a cache. Well, that trades space for time. Um, uh, the developmental quality. Maybe it gets more complex. Adding a piece of caching to a piece of code makes it more complex. It's not that it's wrong. It's just that it's going to be more challenging. That's a piece of code you have to deal with you would not otherwise have had to deal with. Sometimes we discover that the code gets simpler. Um, you'd be surprised what the power of a good delete can do every now and then. And it's just like, oh, yeah, we got rid of that code. And guess what? Everything ran faster or used less memory. It's like, right, we chose a particular data structure and actually got rid of a whole load of code. And we got better performance as a result. But the reason I want to focus on this is obviously refactoring, which is another behavior-preserving trans, uh, transformation or functionality-preserving transformation. So behavior-preserving is the term that um, uh, Bill and uh, Martin used. But we should be a little clearer. So there's kind of a, a, a balance here. Um, and this is where our tooling can help. This is where our tests can help um, in determining that we have respected that constraint, that we haven't broken with the existing um, functionality. But our goal is to improve something on the developmental axis. That is our explicit goal. Now, you can use these different dimensions of change as a way of breaking down your commits. You can say, oh, OK, I've got a whole load of things to do. Let's walk through them. OK, here's a, here's a bug fix. Let's not roll the bug fix. Now, are we going to do the bug fix first? Yeah, probably. Let's do the bug fix first. OK? Now, performance improvement? OK, let's do that. Check that one in. OK, now let's take a step back and see where we are with the code and if there's anything that I can do to improve it or if there are any insights that I can get from it that I want to change, take the code in a new direction. Maybe it's just a small tidy, but maybe it's actually a proper design nudge down a different fork, as it were. So we have the process of refactoring. What does it mean to refactor? To restructure software by applying a series of refactorings without changing the observable behavior semantic behavior, functional behavior, of the software. Now, there's a really subtle thing here that's easy to read past. And curiously enough, in spite of being aware of it, I read past it for a number of years. I kind of picked up on it when the book first came out, and then kind of ignored it whenever I pointed this quote out to people. A series of refactorings. He uses plural. To refactor is to, you're not just going to do one thing. There's a, it's a progression. You're, you're on a journey here, OK? So the idea is that refactoring is a process. And when do we do it? Well, as the author Annie Dillard observed, how we spend our days is, of course, how we spend our lives. Yeah, don't, don't make refactoring the thing you're going to do in the future. Oh, we'll have a big refactoring sprint. Or, you know, we'll, we'll do it, you know, after the next major release, we'll do it. it. It's a daily thing. It's like you don't save up. Well, I hope you don't. Um, Personal hygiene till the end of the month. 
You know, oh, I'm going to save time to, yeah, okay. So here's a developer approaching personal hygiene, the way that we approach code. You know, I'm going to save time today. I'm going to save time by not brushing my teeth, not having a shower, and doing all those things. See how much time I've saved? And then at the end of the month, you're going to, I'm going to spend eight hours just like, you know, the whole month. Then I'm going to go and see people who, for some reason, have been avoiding me for the last month. You know, I thought that kind of like, you know, social distancing was not the thing anymore, but apparently it is. I can't explain why. Yeah, systems thinking will help you with this. So, let's talk about the automated side of things. The fact that it is, so the fact that we have relied very much, a lot of people, when they arrive into software development, their understanding of refactoring is coupled to the idea of automation. It's very difficult to arrive in software development these days and not hear refactoring in the context of an IDE. That's how you will be introduced to it. The focus of this thesis on the, is on the automation, uh, automating the refactorings in a way that preserves the behavior of a program. This was 1992, with the work he began in the late 80s. So what are the kinds of things that we might do? So here's a book that uh, published, oh, the beginning of the last decade. Um, 97 things every programmer should know. I'm going to pick an example from Dan Horse North, code in the language of the domain. I, I like this example for a number of reasons. Um, there's a lot we could be talking about in terms of the domain understanding, um, but it's kind of a key point. Um, it's about reflecting on knowledge and how we learn things and how sometimes we don't truly appreciate what we know until we see it reframed in a different sense. So if we look at this, we might look at that and go, oh, portfolio IDs by trader ID, don't get trader ID, it contains key portfolio. Okay, so this is some Java code, um, and every single identifier there makes sense. There's, there's no problem. There's the only abbreviation in there is ID, and that's a real world abbreviation, not a developer abbreviation. Strictly speaking, there is nothing there that we can rename. So we might say, oh, this deserves a comment or, or something like that. But I still don't understand what it means. So maybe that's why I want to comment. Alternatively, we can realize actually what we want to do is rename the whole thing. The scope of renaming is not just an identifier. Sometimes what you want is a name for a bunch of stuff. But we tend to call that extract method. And then suddenly you realize that this is actually, ah, oh, trader can view portfolio, okay? If a particular trader to prevent insider dealing, is if they, are, if they, are, they have permissions on portfolio. So this is uh, from an investment bank. But here, all that stuff is now squirreled away. The logic is still there. The mechanics are still there. There's nothing wrong with that description of the mechanics. It was just at the wrong level. This is the decision that I'm taking at this point, if trader can view. Well, oh, it's cool. So interesting enough, that is one of the most common refactorings you're likely to do, extract method. So um, last year, I kind of put this online, and I tweeted this. And you know, one of the great things about languages, modern IDE sport, is that thanks to refactoring tools, legacy code is a thing of the past. And like with all the languages, developers never have to experience long methods, rambling classes, poor identifier names, complex logic. Honestly, for those of you who have entered software development in the last two decades, I envy you. You will never know the pain of legacy code. You will never know what people are talking about when they talk about bad naming or long methods or rambling classes. You will never experience this, like some people didn't experience the tweet after, or the one after that. Well, here's the point. We actually solved the problem. We solved the problem of legacy code in the 1990s and rolled it out in the 2000s. Here in 2023, we should have, strictly speaking, almost no code that somebody from that period of time would have called legacy. But we do. Which tells you it wasn't a problem of automation at all. It was never a problem of automation. Yeah, if you don't know what you're going to do with it, it doesn't matter if the thing I don't know what I want to do with is automated or not. It turns out that what we needed to teach and promote was the idea that it's OK to change the structure and design of your code as it reflects your understanding. That that is a normal practice. It is not a thing you have to ask permission for. It has a name. It's called software development. If you're a software developer, it's already in your job title. You have permission. That's what it's about. If you could transform the daily experience of yourself and others 
from constantly being on the back foot fighting, fighting the past rather than creating the future, that's kind of, yeah, that's kind of a good thing. What we've done is we've removed a large source of friction. And yeah, on a routine basis, so let's just align this linguistically. Uh, C sharp, 2002. 2001-2002. There should be no uh, refactoring tools were not immediate. They followed a little bit later. Java hit the world in 96. Went through a major growth curve, particularly the enterprise stuff. Came along at around the same time as refactoring tools started being rolled out in Eclipse, IntelliJ, and becoming standard. Strictly speaking, we live at a point where th there should not be significant legacy problems that people are fighting, and yet there are. So, Let's try and understand that it wasn't a tooling issue. It was a problem of understanding and culture, and continues to be. It's nice to have tools. No, don't get me wrong on that, but that's not the problem. So, you know, in a clearly scientific, totally scientific approach, I ask people online for their opinions. What family of refactors do you find you use most, whether automated or not? I, I was not surprised by the answers. Extract method was one of the most popular. Here's a bunch of stuff. I want to give it a name. Extractor. Here's the thing with the name. I want to give it a different name. In fact, rename is a broad family of things. Individual variables, all the way up to interfaces and packages. But of course, there are boundaries to renaming. We do have to respect that there's not, it's not perfectly fluid. Um, you know, once you hit once you hit the, the problem of, uh, oh, you're using that thing that I gave you, and your code base is not my code base. I don't have, and you're actually under a different project management regime. And in fact, you might be in a different organization. It turns out that that, that changes things. And I remember a team struggling with this in the early 2000s. They kept refactoring their interface names and saying, Kevlet, and they, sometimes people ask you questions when you come in as an outsider. They, what the people are looking for is permission. They're looking at, well, actually, no, they're looking for absolution, not permission. They are looking for a blessing. Kevlin, we are breaking another team's code. Please, you know, forgive us and tell us that it's all okay. Okay. And that was the problem. What they were doing is on a daily basis, they were changing their mind about some APIs and breaking another team's build on a regular basis. Yeah, it turns out that it's social engineering you need at this point. It was not a tooling problem. Okay. Uh, sometimes, of course, the, there are things that we find we cannot change. My favorite story is clonable. Um, well, for those of you watching .NET, iClonable. Now, what is interesting about this is that that's how you spell it in English. You'll notice that there isn't that, there are, that E just disappeared. And obviously, a lot of people are going like, yeah, but English spelling doesn't really have a regular system of spelling. You know, for those of you who've learned English as a second or third language, it may well be the language with the worst and most complicated spelling system that you have ever learned. But let me tell you, let me assure you, the problem is not that English does not have a regular system of spelling. The problem is that it has about six or seven regular systems of spelling all at once. That's the problem. It's not the absence of it. It's, it's got a surplus. You've just got to guess which one are you feeling lucky. And they got it wrong. In fact, this is not a, the, remember I said about knowledge and our ability to incorporate knowledge as we go? Thanks to Twitter, I was able to track this one down because I remember, we're in the mid 90s, I remember somebody pointing this one out. Right back before it was released, before Java 1.0.2, which was the first proper release. Back in 19, the beginning of 1996, in fact, we just passed the anniversary. I just realized. There we go. 17th of January was last week. Clonable is misspelled with only one E. It's spelled with only one E. Ask any geneticist, including my wife. Ask any English specialist. We'll come back to that. Such as Henry McGilton. It's embarrassing. Let's fix it before we ship. We can't fix it after. And right now, very little code relies upon this typo. Now, there's a couple of things there. You will notice. English is not spelt correctly. It turns out, also, I had to check this one, McGilton is not spelt correctly either. And for those of you who are interested, this is a known phenomenon. Um, it's called Muffrey's Law. <laughs> um, 
If you write anything correcting or criticizing the quality of someone else's editing, proofing, spelling, grammar, etc., there will be some kind of editorial error in what you have written. Yeah, anybody experience that one? Absolutely, yeah. <coughs> Murphy's Law is a specific application of Murphy's Law. Right, so that one aside, there's a point there. Obviously, we can't refactor everything. We do have, you know, there's a kind of a sense in our architecture. Let's go back to that idea of architecture. Architecture is the definite, one of the parts of architecture is the definition of structure, it's the definition of boundaries. Things inside the boundary are free and easy to change. Things that are not so easy to change, those are architectural. They are harder to move. Um, if we, I mean, uh, the, uh, those of you who grapple with the architecture of this building, the Queen Elizabeth II Center is a, uh, is a labyrinth of complexity and brutalist architecture. Um, there are some rooms where, you know, so you can actually see it in this room, you see these columns here. Don't mess with those, they hold the building up. Okay, everything else, everything in space is free to move. This stage is temporary. I can move that freely. The point here is there are some things you can't change and some things you can. Ideally, you want to minimize the bits that you can't change. Okay, so you want to place your boundaries, and this is something we learn over time. You want to place your boundaries to allow freedom on the other side. In other words, you constrain your degrees of freedom on one side, say, actually, we're gonna really, it's gonna, you're gonna struggle to change the signature of this interface or anything about this. We will have to have a, we'll publish a, a version in deprecation model. But I can't do that just with a simple, you know, um, uh, flick of a shortcut. But then on the inside, I create the spaces that allow me the freedom on the inside. That's what you're trying to do, maximize the freedom on the other side of those boundaries. That's why we obsess so much about classes and components and services and things like that. We're looking for more meaningful boundaries that allow us the ease and softness on the inside and recognize that it's going to be tougher on the outside. But I also want to applaud the achievements of software developers and software development as an industry. Uh, here's Wiktionary. The entry on clonable, notice the spelling. But notice the alternative forms, especially in computing contexts. Clonable with that extra E. We have changed the spelling of a word through repeated misuse. Repetition legitimizes. Repetition legitimizes. Repetition legitimizes. But it also, this is not news. We go back to the late 90s. Martin offers us advice on this. Don't publish interfaces prematurely. Modify your code ownership policies to smooth refactoring. He's talking again about boundaries and the socio-technical side, the relationship to people. That's what you want to do. You want to get away, from, and this is the interesting thing, this runs in the face of the common, commonly communicated advice of the open-closed principle, the idea that your classes should be open to extension and closed to modification. That's kind of like, that's a practice that is based on fear. It is a principle that is based on, I can't change anything. It's actually the opposite of good practice. So if you're following OCP, or you think you're following OCP, according to that, don't. Prefer good practice instead. Make code as open to modification as possible. Instead of rolling over and saying, ah, oh, can't change it, say, how do I organize my structure to allow me to be able to change it? Change is not the problem. I want to encourage it. I don't want to push it down. I don't want to say you're not allowed to do that. And I'm, not, I'm also not going to put in all that noise that encourages extension, that kind of like speculative generality. We want to move in exactly the opposite direction. Closed open principle, if you want. Okay, OCP is a, is a failure of good practice. It's a failure of architecture if you're doing that. So the other things, what are the ones that are overlooked? Extract class. So this is interesting, because although rename class and rename method and all these renames have the same kind of grouping in people's minds, people are much happier to do extract method than extract class. And there are a number of reasons for that. Sometimes it's difficult to identify an abstraction, but perhaps take the time. If you've, if you've got a class that's getting too big, you know, do, do, do start wondering about its, its gravitational attraction. You know, if your class is kind of like pulling in all the other code, then you've got a black hole there and you probably want to do something about it. So extracting class is massively underused. Extract interface is also not particularly used. So extraction is not uniformly popular, it's an approach. Inlining things, the reverse. 
It's a very useful technique sometimes when you're trying to make the code move in a different way. Sometimes you don't want to pull everything out. You want to put it all back so you can see what's going on and then repartition it, reorganize it. It's actually an instinct I found. I run some refactoring workshops and I'm always fascinated. People immediately reach for extract method as one of their first refactorings was actually it's kind of something you should do a little bit later in many cases. Not all cases. It'd be context sensitive. Replace one thing with another, one construct with another. Getting rid of stuff is also important. As I observed a few years ago, we keep talking about incremental development. We don't talk enough about decremental development. Get rid of stuff. Okay? Streamline the thing. Okay? Your knowledge allows you to say, this is dead code. Nobody's using this. What's it doing in the code base? I've wasted time in a new code base looking through something only to be told by another developer, oh, don't look at that. We don't use that. Well, why is it in the code? It doesn't cause any harm. I've just spent a day looking at it. You know, I mean, I don't feel injured by it, but you know, time-wise, we've taken a hit. So let me just give you a very simple toy example. Let's mess about with Roman numerals, because obviously that's something that everybody does on a daily basis in their enterprise software. Actually, it probably would improve a lot of things, to be fair. Um, but speaking of enterprise software, here is how we might approach this one. So this is Python. Um, and this is, uh, you can't see everything, so let's re resize. There you go. Again, if you've been paying by the line of code, there is absolutely nothing wrong with this. But that's the thing about all toy examples. What I love about a lot of coding carters is you, people kind of go, oh, that's too simple, that's a toy example. Then you go straight into the code base they're working on, you go, yeah, and it's exactly like the logic that you've got here. Okay, sometimes you have to kind of look through this as a lens to see something else. So this is how to convert an integer into Roman numerals. Uh, there's nothing wrong with it. It works in that sense, if that's our only goal. I don't regard this as particularly good. It's brutally imperative. It's unnecessarily imperative. Okay? This does not need to be, even if you're doing procedural coding, this is relentless in a way that I would not expect anyone to recommend. Yet, curiously, um, as a collector of old books in software, and I kind of lived through the period where people recommended Pascal as a good language because it will teach you good practice and it's got good language design. And you know what? I was foolish enough to believe people. Pascal is a terrible language. It's really badly designed and it does not promote good practice in any way. It's massively limited. Every now and then, I will get somebody, either in person or on Twitter, who comes up to try and correct me of this. And they say, oh, but I really like Delphi. That's fine, but that's not Pascal. The only way that that language was any good is because they took the original and said, wow, this sucks. Let's add things to it. In other words, they made it palatable. It is so limited that you cannot express, well, in fact, let's just look at the example. There it is. I was leafing through it, and oh, Roman numerals. Done in exactly the way that I said, you shouldn't do it. So let's actually try and amend this. Now, what a lot of people will do when looking at this is they will seek out a pattern. Now, I'm not expecting you to see the detail of this. It's intentionally small enough that only, only people with good eyesight in the back will be able to see this. And I, I don't want you to look at that. I want you to, sometimes the trick with code is to try and take a step back and squint at it, OK? or alternatively just choose a smaller font. What do you see? What's the form of it? You can see a lot of repetition and structure. So we're going to refactor this. And we're going to do so in a way that we don't break it. And in fact, here's the tests. In fact, you don't even need a testing framework. So this is, this is what I used uh, with this one. It's a variation of what I used. So here is testing without a testing framework. We're going to look at that. And we're going to go, what do I see first of all? Um, and the contrast on that is absolutely terrible. That's a real shame. Um, yeah, contrast is terrible. OK, um, that, you see, that's what you get for having a colorblind guy uh, do the slides. Um, so um, what we see is that there are groupings of four, while if, 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 while if, 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 while if, 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 and then one while left over. What many people see is this recurring structure. In other words, if we reframed it, while the number is greater than or equal to 10 something, it might be 10, 100, 1,000. If number is greater than or equal to 9 something, it might be 9, 90, or 900. And the same for 5, 50, 500, 4, 40, 400. In other words, there's a repeating structure. 
And then people will be tempted to extract method of this repeating structure. Premature refactoring. Hold yourself back a little bit. Take another look. It turns out in this case, if you look at this and squint at it just right, the thing to remember is that, and this is the whole thing about looking at things from different points of view, and why refactoring is not just a simple, a simple activity in the sense of it requires a little bit of insight. Those ifs, sometimes in the limit, an if behaves just like a while, in the sense that an if executes zero or one times. It's a very limited while. In this particular case, because of the way the values fall, you can replace all of these with while, and it still works. Which means that your repeating unit is, in fact, this. Which leads to a completely different style of solution. Even if you're doing, although this is strongly declarative, it's data-driven, people don't get taught about data-driven techniques enough. Um, they don't get taught about it as a first-class paradigm or combining paradigm. This is very procedural. It's got a procedural for loop. But this is a technique that I would expect any C programmer at least to know. Not a, I wouldn't expect a Pascal programmer to know. But I'd expect any C programmer to know it from way back when. But it's also something that is yeah, drop-dead easy in pretty much any language. The idea is let's drive it with data. What is the commonality? Look for the data structure. Now, the late Frederick Brooks made this observation back in the 1970s. That representation is the essence of programming. Sometimes the strategic breakthrough will be a new algorithm. Much more often, strategic breakthroughs will come from redoing the representation of the data or tables. This is where the heart of the program lies. The idea of try and understand the structure of the data and then invert the control with respect to that. Whereas far too often when people refactor, they're just kind of nibbling at the edges and just taking the surface phenomena and refactoring those and tidying those up and often bundling them away into extract method. So we can imagine here, here's another little example. This is in C sharp. What I've got here, I go through here, I go, right, I've got a new list. So I've been given some list of words. Maybe it's an enumerable. Maybe, Maybe it's actually another list. Maybe it's an array. I've got a list of words. So I create a copy of that. Then I sort it. And then I drop, in, I drop abstraction level into a bunch of mechanics. OK? It's just like there's a, there's, a real, there's a real change here, this idea that you should try and work at the same level of abstraction. If you suddenly find yourself dropping into mechanics, it doesn't mean you don't want the mechanics. It just means you need to kind of think, well, hang on. I said The first thing I said was take a copy. Then I said, sort it. And now I say, right, set up a variable, assign it to null. OK, you, you're at the wrong level here. And there's a whole load of horsing around, which is ultimately about removing duplicates. So let's call it that. Remove duplicates. So this is C sharp, I can make it an extension method and confuse all my colleagues. We can improve on the naming, because it's not really about removing duplicates. It's about removing adjacent duplicates. That's the more honest one. The precondition is that it must be sorted to remove all duplicates. But actually, it's just about removing adjacent duplicates. And for a lot of people, they go, huh, yeah, we're done. We've improved it. Some people will then say, stand back. I know Link. Oh, no, I'd ask you to stand back. That's not a big improvement, I'm afraid. Um, I know that repetition legitimizes, but if you've got the same variable occurring three times in a single expression, you've got to say that's a smell. A better use of link would not to be used to use the keywords and would be this form. And we might, we might pat ourselves on the back and say we are done. But then I hear the words of the late Fred Brooks. Representation is the essence of programming. Huh, oh yeah, that's what I wanted. What I wanted was basically a collection of unique words in sorted order. And what I've done is, and what's funny is that people often say, oh yeah, you're using functional thinking here. Yeah, look at me using data structures. So the whole point is this is the most declarative of all of them. I've just said what I want. I'm not telling you how to do it. I'm not giving you a process. This is that. So sometimes refactoring will take us down some surprising avenues, some different insights. And it's a reminder, Dijkstra observed back in 72, the purpose of abstraction is not to be vague. We often associate abstraction sometimes with being vague, which actually 
is this precision to create a new semantic level in which one can be absolutely precise. It's to be specific. This is what I really mean. I'm not going to tell you. If I've got something there that does exactly what I need, I might not realize that. And importantly, that progression I just showed you is not, a, is not to diss anybody for ever having this code or going through those steps. Sometimes those steps are necessary intermediates until something becomes so obvious you go, oh, wow, why did I not see this before? You couldn't have seen it before. You were locked into a different mindset. Refactoring is getting your hands dirty in the code. It's playing with the clay. Okay? It's actually reshaping. You go, oh, now I understand. You thought you understood when you started, but only when you start manipulating it. You say, oh, now I've messed about with it. Six ways to Sunday, I can now figure out the seventh way. So, uh, final piece I'll look at, um, another one from 97 Things, to show you kind of a radical reframing, one I've used a number of times, one of my favorite pieces from that book by uh, Bert Hafnagel. Although I'm not supposed to say, as the editor, I have favorite pieces. Um, put the mouse down and step away from the keyboard. First of all, great title. It, it, it tells you exactly how to deal with most problems. You get so entrenched at the level at which you found the problem, you try everything and exhaust that level. And the only thing apparently left to you is to invest more time. And what you do is you push harder at the thing that's not working for you. You're stuck at that level. Take a step back. Do something that, in fact, I, I often tell people, whatever it is that you're not doing, try that. As in, if you are currently sitting, try standing. If you are currently standing, try sitting. If you are listening to music, turn the music off. If you're not listening to music, turn some music on. Yeah? If I'm messing about with code or working, typically I will listen to ambient music um, uh, or I'll listen to just sort of, uh, sort of rainforest or ocean sounds. If I'm stuck with something, sometimes I turn that off or alternatively I put on some progressive metal. You just need to get your mind, because clearly wherever you are is not helping you. You need to move somewhere else. If you've been drinking caffeine all morning, guess what? Herbal tea is a really good break from that. If you're saying, ah, oh, I'm virtuous, I don't drink caffeine, try it. Try it. Come to the dark side. But that's the thing. It'll change the way you think. Go for a walk. Have a chat with somebody. Yeah? Don't, don't, don't try and ring up a somebody that you currently have a grievance with, um, like your, you know, uh, like a provider. Yeah, 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 no, no. You did say that we'd be reconnected by Tuesday. No, that's just going to get you angry. But do something else. Why? Because it gives you a different insight. It refreshes things. You, you save time by doing something else rather than investing on that current problem. So here is a, a piece of code that um, Burke was looking at. In fact, this is not the piece of code Burke was looking at. This is the piece of code after he refactored it the first time. So it must have been quite frightening the first time. He took some code and he said, oh, OK, let's cook it down. And that's the important thing. A lot of people stop here. They do the kind of the cooking down. They kind of a little bit extract method, a little bit of tidying up of the logic, a few renames and a bit of movement. But they haven't actually challenged or the, 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 the assumption of where the code is. And sometimes you can't do that immediately. That's fine. But that's why he you know, put the mouse down and stepped away from the keyboard. But you can see there's a lot going on here. And in fact, you know, the, the thing I want to point out is there's a dot, dot, dot here. <laughs> there's a lot more of this stuff. This is relentlessly imperative. We're trying to parse a string to see if it contains a valid 12-hour time. It's a brutal way of doing it. So anyway, he steps away from the keyboard and suddenly realizes, wait a minute, this is a pattern matching problem. Why, why, am I, why am I doing all of this? This is a really painful way to do it. Again, I refer you to large amounts of code in the world. Now, of course, there is the idea that sometimes people say, you know, I had a problem, I solved it with the regex, now I have two problems, or star problems, if you're being incredibly accurate. But sometimes it's just the right thing. And what's great is if even, even if you don't know regexes, it's really easy to explain. So I can take my youngest son, he's 17, he knows Python. I can walk him through this Java, he will have lost interest before we reach the dot, dot, dot. Just, uh, what do you think? What's the explanation sound like? I mean, he's seen exceptions before, all this kind of stuff. I mean, in fact, probably you'd say, Dad, why didn't they do it in Python? And I'll say, son, I don't know. Python solves a surprising number of problems. It's not perfect, but when it comes to string manipulation, Java is one of the most painful ways of doing it. Um, it's like putting needles in your eyes, just not as much fun. Um, 
But here, I don't think my son knows regexes. But I can walk left to right. I'm trying to find out whether this string matches, oh, well, there we go, immediately, um, a grouping of 0 followed by 1 to 9 or 1 followed by 0 to 2. And then a colon, because in height, 0 followed by uh, 0 to 5, and then 0 to 9. Five, OK. Um, repetition legitimizes. Um, 0 to 5, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the point here is I've just read that left to right. That's the property of declarative code. In many forms of declarative code, showing the data structure, you just literally describe the shape of the problem. Then all you need is a little icing, a for loop or an appropriate method, and that does the thing. This is the kind of thing that we need to be encouraging ourselves. But notice there is no named refactoring for this. I've changed the design by having to, I've jostled the existing design around, probably through automation, automated refactorings. I've jostled it around, and then eventually, oh, now I understand. Take a break, now I understand. So that brings us onto the home straight and the need for coffee, because I realize I have overrun by five minutes. I took you back in time. Let's take you back further. Let's go back to the 19th century. This is Isabella Beaton, who died sadly very young. Uh, she was uh, not even 30, I don't think. But um, she wrote a, a series of columns um, on household management that got collected into a book. Um, and her Mrs. Beaton's book and Mrs. Beaton's cookery book were actually kind of they survived well into the 20th century as a kind of a byword for how to think about, you know, actually. The engineering, and, uh, the engineering of the processes of your, of your home. Um, but when it came to kitchens, she, it turns out that she was an early adopter of refactoring. There is no work like early work. Okay. How we live our lives is, of course, how we spend our days. Clear as you go, muddle makes more muddle. Yeah, she was talking about code, but Babbage had not yet invented the difference engine, so she was forced to talk about kitchens instead. Not to wash plates and dishes soon after using makes more work. Yeah, see the word, see it's all about refactoring, cleverly coded. But also, if we relate the activity of writing code to the activi other activities of writing, Ernest Hemingway left us with the simplest advice. The only kind of writing is rewriting. Thank you very much. Okay, I don't have any time for questions. Sorry, can I have the mic up? Okay, I don't have any time for questions at the moment. Or rather, I do, but well, let's take those offline. I'm around for coffee and all the rest of the day. Um, but uh, yeah, have a good rest of the day.